Welcome back to the Ricina Dialogue 2021. Today we are going to be engaging with what in my view is one of the most important questions for societies of the future, in fact societies of today. Um, titled Recoding the Future, uh, this particular panel acknowledges that digital technologies will drive growth and development in the coming decade. At the moment, regulations that manage this facet of our lives require some work, some rethink, and some collaboration as well. Uh, in the absence of these regulations and clear-cut rules for the road, uh, there are bound to be security concerns, anxieties, and hostilities. Uh, it is in all our interests to put together frameworks, norms, rules, regulations, and laws that all can live with. The 5G debate has in many ways made this also a political debate. Uh, the recent phenomena, or rather the age old phenomena in its new avatar, fake news and uh, influence operations has begun to rear its ugly head and has created new challenges. Uh, many societies are more fragile today, post the availability of the digital than they were in the times when digital was not an option. And many of these immediate concerns are also absolutely vital for big governance of tech and governance of big tech. And I use both those phrases with responsibility. Uh, to discuss all of this, we have uh, a fantastic panel. We have uh, the Vice President of the European Commission, Marguerite Vestea, um, who actually is entrusted with uh, the future of the digital union. And if you ask any big tech in West Coast who do they recognize immediately, it would be her. She has taken on the big tech and she is working with them today to put together a new architecture for the future. Welcome to Raisina Man. Um, we have with us uh, Nandan Nilakani, who requires no introduction. Uh, the man who architected India's uh, digital ID program, who built India's uh, earliest unicorn, uh, who created a financial services and a, a, a digital services uh, company out of Bangalore, and someone who is widely credited as having created the digital revolution uh, that India seems to be benefiting from. And uh, last but not the least is my favorite di digital evangelist, uh, Mariche Shake, who was a member of the European Parliament, has now gone to the dark side. She's a colleague of mine in the not-for-profit sector, thinks about policy, engages with policy ideas, and protests about everything, pretty much like all think tankers do. So uh, Mariche, welcome to this show and welcome back to Raisina Dialogue. Um, let me start with you, Madam Vice President, uh, and let me um, it, uh, put before you the original question that I had highlighted in my opening remarks. The absence of sufficient global tech governance has been creating anxiety, security concerns, and hostilities. What for the EU are key concerns around governance and regulations of technology and innovation? They are quite fundamental concerns. And uh, one of the things that's really encouraging for us is that these fundamental concerns, they have become now part of a global conversation because they are fundamental concerns about the level playing field in the marketplace. That every business with an innovative idea, with a, with a willingness to, to produce uh, the best possible products and services to the customers, that they have a fair chance of reaching potential customers. One fundamental concern. Second fundamental concern, that there is uh, not sufficient um, enforcement when it comes to the online world on issues where we have agreed for decades after thorough democratic debate, uh, things should be illegal in the offline world. Uh, that could be excitement to terrorism. That could be the distribution of bomb recipes. That could be abuse of, uh, of children. So a very fundamental thing that in your society, that things that are illegal, that they are actually being clamped down upon. And last but not least, that uh, in the development of our democracy, uh, that the starting point is the uh, integrity and the dignity of the individual uh, as a participant uh, in our democracy. So it is uh, fundamentals concerning sort of the, the role and the rights of the citizens, the role uh, and the rights of a consumer 
uh, and a customer and the role and the rights of, uh, of businesses of all sizes. Uh, and, and it is because of these concerns that we've been pushing for an elaborate ele um, legislative program and, of course, at the same time, uh, vigilantly uh, enforcing competition law. Uh, are you popular with the big folks in uh, West Coast of America? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. That's just a, a, no. a little bit. But uh, it's a job. It's not a popularity contest. Great. Uh, uh, so, uh, Mr. Nelligani, let me turn to you. I, I, th I think she has given me a good segue to ask you um, to take that conversation forward. In some ways, um, how do you respond to the contentious issue of data ownership? Where does data sovereignty begin? Where does it end? Uh, how does it implicate a country like India, which has 1.3 billion people, many of whom depend on the digital for uh, sustenance, for life, for livelihood? And of course, uh, it is also a growth sector which is creating wealth and valuation. So a country like India, how should we be looking and thinking and assessing questions around data sovereignty, data ownership, data choice, data agency? Uh, thank you, Samir. And uh, it's really wonderful to be on this panel with Ms. Vestayer and uh, Marjite. I think, uh, you know, the, uh, Ms. Vestayer has been uh, at the front of dealing with these challenges. And for many years, she was having a lonely furrow. But now I think around the world, regulators and others are concerned of the same issues. If you see what's happening in China, for example, and we see the Chinese banking regulator questioning the huge amount of data which is there with uh, with these big uh, fintech groups. I think what we have done in India is very, very seminal, uh, Samir, and we are the only country now which has an architecture where we empower people with their own data. And we have done this at population scale, which means that a billion people in India can access their own data and use it for purposes that they want to. For example, if I'm a small business and I want to get a loan, I can get my banking statement from my bank. I can get my tax receipts from the tax authorities. I can get my insurance claims from the insurance company. And I can bundle all this under my encrypted basis and give it to one or more lenders who then will decide whether it's worth lending to. This, this whole thing is called a data empowerment uh, and protection architecture. And I think some of the people who worked on this are presenting this to Ms. Vestaya tomorrow. So this is meant for a billion people. This is not just for one or two people. And the key thing is we have on the one side information providers and on the other side we have information users. And we've introduced a new concept in India called consent managers who are neutral parties who sit at the junction of these and who work on your behalf to direct your data in a safe way to somebody else. And the first use case of this is going to be in our financial systems where uh, the, our central bank has already notified the, uh, you know, the, these account aggregators and we expect to now have small businesses and individuals applying for loans with their own data. So I personally believe, while I think it's very important that we get the regulation and all that right, we have to address this with technology also. And the fundamental technology challenge is how do you, how do you make sure data aggregation is, is countered with data empowerment? And I think that data empowerment is what we in India have done, and I think it's actually a model for the world, which I hope uh, people will realize at some point. So I, I think that's a good point, uh, Nandan. You uh, mentioned um, data empowerment, and you mentioned uh, uh, the uh, the the two sides of the regulatory coin. Um, uh, my question to you is that is the Indian experience exportable, or is this a uniquely Indian solution for uh, this particular geography? And oh, are there yeah. attempts to try and take it outside? Oh, it is absolutely exportable. I think the three things we did, one was we designed digital ID, which was not a corporate ID given by a corporation, but given by the state, which you could then say that no data is collected about me with my ID. Because part of the problem in all this is that your ID is used as a basis for collecting data about you. So we solved that with the digital ID. Second thing, we built a, a payment system, UPI, which did about 2.7 billion transactions last month which is a completely uh, open uh, payment platform, multiple banks, multiple big tech, everybody can uh, participate, but there's no winner take all. It's really a very competitive, innovative scenario. And the third thing we have done is this data empowerment. All these three are ideas that have global applicability. And I do believe that even as, as regulators and other policymakers deal with the challenge of bringing in innovation and competition, 
they should also look at the technological underpinnings required to make this happen. Mm -hmm. um, Maniche, that's a, that's a good segue to you. Uh, you have been part of the policy making uh, group in Europe uh, as a member of the European Parliament. You are now um, at Stanford and also heading a Cyber Peace Institute and you're looking at some of the big digital questions uh, from a different perspective. Uh, you're also someone who has made a career switch during the pandemic. Uh, so uh, this year when you changed your life and the life and the world changed around you, what for you are those important technology questions that uh, 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 Madam Vice President and uh, the big uh, business thinker, Mr. Nandan Lelikani should be grappling with? What are the questions that keep you up? What are the issues that you believe urgently require a response? Well, thanks, Samir. It's, it's great to join uh, Raisina again, even if we would have loved to be in India altogether. Um, I think for many people, the pandemic has been an extraordinary year, but it has also laid bare some existing problems. And I think when we look at the impact of digitization, uh, we see how much the past year, year and a half has exacerbated inequalities. So anything from you know access to laptops for children who couldn't go to school to uh, the, the benefits for large retail platforms who could deliver all the groceries uh, and the mom and pop stores that had to be closed or you know the differences in risk for people who drive an Uber or deliver food. Basically the, the modern day wagers that would simply earn no income if they took a day off to protect themselves and their families. So all the socioeconomic impacts of digitization became more tangible uh, and also the differences between societies where safety nets exist uh, and where they where they're absent or, or where they fail and and you know questions of who will pay into the public purse to cover unemployment benefits and so on second element I would say is this growing dependence on private companies, right? We all use much more uh, uh, video connection uh, services or uh, email because it's the only way we can go to work or school or be entertained, access culture, do our shopping. Uh, but we also saw sprawling of COVID apps, uh, access passports, another area where tech companies could play a big role and uh, you know, entrenched their power and their role in people's lives. And so we saw new security risks as a result. You know, a company like Zoom uh, came out of nowhere, essentially, and uh, the security questions were, were caught up with later. Uh, and we've seen over the past year some extraordinary uh, intrusions. The SolarWinds hack, the Exchange Server hack, data breaches at social media companies like LinkedIn and Facebook. So clearly uh, there is a challenge with this huge dependence on technologies. And I would say, you know, this, this huge dependence and questions of how we can maintain it uh, to be a trusted relationship, a fair relationship, mm -hmm. uh, a dynamic where people's rights are protected is very important. So solutions should come from governance uh, oh. areas, but hopefully on the basis of shared values. And this is where I think the biggest um, challenges are the stakes are high there's geopolitical battles between which systems might best address these questions on the basis of which you know uh, fundamental values foundations and i'm very hopeful that there will be a broader appreciation between democratic states that they need to work together to create a critical mass and to to govern across borders and to make sure that you know that not everything is disrupted and that fairness security and rights protections can be maintained even as digitization you know continues to intensify thank you mariche uh, madam vice president you had your hand up sorry i missed it the first time around i'm i, I think it was in response to something something uh, london may have said so over to you first uh Yes, uh, it, it was in, because I, I became very uh, enthusiastic uh, by, by the response because I do think that it's a very important point that um, deploying technology is part of the solution because we can empower uh, via legislation by securing rights, but only with technology can these rights be something that people can actually enforce. Mm -hmm. uh, only with technology can these services that can breach some of the inequalities that Maricha just addressed, only then can they be breached, uh, uh, breached uh, some of these inequalities. So I think that the deployment of technology and the uh, exportability uh, of different solutions, I think that is a key issue here. Uh, 
Uh, and I, I really agree with this uh, fact uh, that if you give people, you know, real everyday services that they can use and that applies uh, convenience to them, that uh, fills a gap that was otherwise empty, then the absorption uh, of, uh, of technology and the digitization of society becomes so much faster. Uh, so, no, this is just to say that uh, I, I completely agree with what was said and, and I really admire uh, the scale and the quality uh, of what has been done uh, to serve uh, the Indian citizen. Uh, Madam Vice President, let me ask you a question that bothers me sometimes. Uh, we have a benign um, appreciation, perhaps even an admiration for coders, for those who make technology solutions. Is it time for coders to also be in some ways assessed um, and certified as those cognizant of how society is going to be shaped by their actions. Are we um, infusing enough social science awareness in the, the technology workforces that are designing uh, uh, our world of the future through uh, AI, through uh, big learn machine learning, through big data? Are we marrying social sciences and being human with being a machine? Is that something that you feel is missing in our education system today? Because uh, I, I feel uncomfortable leaving the world to someone like me who's just an engineering my entire life. Well, the, the short answer to your question is no, we're not doing enough. Uh, we're not doing enough to make uh, the, the, the IT community a diverse community. Uh, just in, in Europe, not only do we lack uh, ICT professionals, but also the diversity of the group is really questionable. Uh, just look at gender. I think 70, 17, 17 percent of, uh, of IT professionals are women. And, uh, and the age span is also quite limited compared to the rest of the population. Uh, if, if the ICT community was the parliament, you would really question uh, if, if they were the only ones to have a say about how our our society should be shaped, how our future should be shaped. So I think this is a this is a, a crucial point because uh, with with the development of technology, with the new services that come, you shape our everyday life, our our convenience, what we do, and to a very large degree, uh, you can also influence uh, what we think about uh, and how we see the world. So we need a more diverse uh, community uh, to to develop uh, technology. Uh, and we need broader considerations. Uh, and this is why when, when I come, came into this uh, job uh, being responsible for a Europe fit for digital age, well, my first consideration was, are we going to be fit for the machine or should it be the other way around? No, of course, the machines must be, must be fit for us uh, because the, the promise of technology is that at long last, we can create societies that are really inclusive and where everyone will have the access to really high quality uh, services, education, health, uh, mobility, uh, but as humans in a society and not just as, as an input uh, to a machine driven uh, society that serves only the few. Mr. Nilkani, would you like to come in on this? You've been in the sector for so long. How has the demographics changed in India in terms of uh, who works on tech, who's driving tech, etc.? Well, I think it, even in India, it continues to be a, a male dominated sector. Uh, there are a lot of women now working in the sector, but they're at relatively junior positions and, you know, they're not able to stay the course because of various personal issues. So that's true. Uh, but I think there's also another thing, which is, you know, the reason why in India we've been able to even come this far, Samir, is that we have a large number of public spirited IT professionals who understand what are the possible risks of winner take all models and have worked for the last decade in creating much more equitable and empowering technology solutions. And that is really the heart of it because it's people who have really, they're not doing it for the money, they're doing it to realize the issues of how to make it happen. I'll give you a recent example uh, and uh, Margie Chem mentioned about the uh, COVID certificates. India is the only country in the world with, which gives a digital vaccination certificate for everybody. This certificate has already reached 100 million people. It's completely uh, open source software. You, you can use it, you can get a certificate, you can keep it on your phone, you can print it out, you can do a verification offline or online. Now, this was 
built as open source for the government or any other government to use. And it's not a private solution, it's an open solution. So I think that making sure that critical elements of the digital infrastructure are uh, you know, open are very, very important. And unfortunately, that also needs technology people who want to solve this problem. And there's also speed. One of the challenges that governments face with the private sector is they, they cannot operate or develop things at the speed that the private sector guys can do. And therefore, you when you come up with something, they come out with something around that. So we need people supporting, uh, te technology people supporting uh, public solutions who are as fast as the private guys. Uh, Mariche, would you like to chime in on, on this diversity debate? Uh, uh, since you are now part of the university system, um, it would be good to know, know your perspective on this. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I was I was always amazed at how often politicians were accused or ridiculed even for not understanding technology sufficiently, but hardly ever is the same criticism uh, expressed vis-a-vis -vis engineers who, uh, in my humble opinion, don't always understand rule of law concepts or the value of democracy and also how, you know, the products that they build fit into a bigger uh, context than just, you know, being faster than the comp competitor or more entertaining or creating greater market values. So um, I believe indeed that this this gap has to be bridged. It's actually one of the things that keeps motivating me, you know, to try to bring the worlds of technology, politics and policy closer together. And we've actually designed, I'm very excited about this, a uh, executive education course at Stanford free of charge for public leaders uh, to um, bring them together and educate them about the latest developments in technology so that they can better inform their their own work uh, the the regulations that they may have to uh, have to work on and we're starting with people from the us and europe but my hope is that we can build this out uh, you know with with the lessons learned to a broader program and i i believe that those sorts of efforts are needed there has to be more common understanding but also i would say a more respectful conversation about the role that technology has in a society and and there cannot be blind eye to the possible downsides which is a tendency that at least i see in silicon valley there there's you know so much wishful thinking going on so many good intentions that they risk overshadowing you know the the real uh, challenges that may also come from using it in a different context or using it uh, you know, with unintended consequences and so on. So I see this as a core field that I'm very motivated to uh, contribute to in my own modest way. And not only by diversifying, but by bringing people with different perspectives uh, in the room together. Uh, so uh, best of luck to you for that, Mariche. Let me uh, come back to uh, 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 Madam Vice President and ask her a question that I have always wondered, and sometimes I've also wondered loudly, uh, which is, uh, why is it that Europe punches below its weight when it comes to innovation? Uh, you keep hearing about these unicorns and big corporations and startups come, coming out of different parts of the world. Uh, uh, the European story seems to be muted here. Is there a regulatory problem businesses face? Uh, is there a market challenge because the size is quite big of the European market is the largest in the world. What is holding back Europe from being the leader that it must be? And by the way, it has in the past uh, led the world in some of the most important technology innovations uh, in the previous cycles of industrialization itself. Well, one, one would think that you have read my job description. Uh, <laughs> because that is uh, that is indeed uh, core because the this, this thing is that Europe is still the place where you have a very strong um, uh, innovation and startup environment. Uh, Europe is still the place where most patents uh, are filed. So it's not lack of, of creative thinking or finding new solutions. Uh, what we have seen is that it's a lack of scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that uh, that comes from a, a number of uh, of different uh, sources. One is um, is the fact that that the the single market is sometimes not very single. Mm -hmm. uh, you still have a number of national markets because of language, because of culture, because of remaining regulatory barriers. Second, uh, you have a very different uh, financing uh, structure. So uh, if a, a company would, uh, would need uh, capital to grow, they would go to the bank and they would create debts. Mm -hmm. 
uh, where in, in other parts of the world you will take investors on board. You would sell 5% and 5% and 5% and you would get capital and you would get competence. Mm -hmm. Because the competence of a growing company is a different than a company, the competence of a startup. So, so we are pushing for, uh, for the market to unify and we are pushing for what we call capital market union in order to make much more room for that kind of more risk willing sort of competence caring uh, capital uh, to come into businesses. Uh, because without that, it's really difficult to see that the scale uh, can happen. The, the last uh, observation is that now when sort of the second big chapter of digitization is, uh, is, is gaining um, speed, uh, we see that some of the European virtues of being an entrepreneurial continent, an industrial continent with a very strong industrial culture, that is so much for, for Europe. Because when everything becomes a data point, and the business to business digitization becomes of the essence. That is a second chance for Europe where we missed out on the sort of uh, business to consumer uh, technologies, social media, market platforms, uh, search. Uh, but that, of course, entails that we get in control of a real single market uh, and a capital system that will support the entrepreneurs that we have. And, and do you uh, a quick follow up? Do you think this new connectivity partnership that uh, we hope India and EU enter into, or the summit that we are hosting, uh, do you believe that there could be a natural partnership in the digital sectors emerge between uh, the innovators in Europe and uh, and uh, Nandan Nilakani and his uh, uh, colleagues in India? Yes, um, I, I am. I'm really enthusiastic about this uh, and, and really encouraged uh, because there's a number of things where we can take uh, inspiration uh, from uh, from Indian solutions in their quality, in their scale. Uh, we sense that there is a, a sort of a, a common mindset uh, developing uh, considerations about democracy, privacy, uh, ownership to data, uh, how to exactly empower citizens uh, to do their best. Uh, and then, of course, with the dynamics of, uh, of, uh, of big democracies uh, coming together uh, also to enable uh, a, a digitization of the entire economy. So I'm, I'm really uh, enthusiastic and I think there is a lot of potential uh, for a strong partnership here. And Nandan, let me um, turn to you with a slightly darker shade of questioning. And I think the next 15 minutes is basically going to uh, be a, a little bit on the darker side. I think we have to recognize some of the challenges that we face as a global community. My first question to Nandan is that, Nandan, you, uh, you've been digitizing everything. In India now, we have everything available on our mobile phones on, uh, on tap, literally. Uh, the service area uh, of the digital is now bigger than India's geographical area. I mean, in, in terms of how much uh, uh, connected we are as people, as businesses, as families, as communities. Uh, are we exposing ourselves to big, big, big cyber incidents, to digital failures? Do we have the capacity, the institutional capacity? Do we have the investments to protect this kind of surface area that we have built up? Who is awake at night so that I can sleep peacefully? Who in India is keeping up with everything that's happening around the world, the, the bads that are likely to come our way if we are not vigilant? Are countries investing equally in the protection of the digital as they are in creating value through digital? I think that's my question to you. Sorry for the well, long I, question. Yeah, no, I think it's a very legitimate question. It's a very worrying question. I think uh, what we have seen in the last decade or 15 years is systematic outward cyber aggression from a few places. And I think uh, certainly in India, you know, I am not so sure that we have barricaded and really made our cyber system so secure against attack. Uh, I've seen it myself in many of the work that we have done. And I think a lot more has to be done to coordinate this and do a much better job of uh, proactively addressing it. And as we saw, and Marija mentioned about solar winds and all that, the way they are now penetrating are becoming more and more sophisticated. And I think on the one side, the sophistication is going up. On the other side, our dependence on technology is going up. And I think the two getting together makes us vulnerable. And I agree with you that we should uh, do uh, be having sleepless nights. Now, I don't know who's the person 
who will be sleeping less. Somebody in Delhi, one of your you know persons there. <laughs> Just one thing I want to add to what uh, Madam Vice President said. In, in India, we have a single market for services. So our capital markets, our banking, our telecom, telecommunications, identity are all single markets. And India had a very poor market for products because every state had its own tax. We solved the second problem by getting GST in. But India was a natural market for services because of the fact that they were all federally regulated across the country and individual states didn't have any power. I think the challenge in Europe, not that I'm an expert, is that they did a great job on the single market for goods, but the services side is still fragmented. And I think that's the opposite of India. And the fact that we had a single market for services enabled us to scale up very rapidly. Uh, but, but I'm not letting you off the hook on the security side. Let me ask you a follow up question. Um, you know, we became uh, in 1997-98 when I used to visit Europe or America, I was asked, are you an engineer? And if my answer was yes, which it normally was because I was an engineer or uh, at least at that time I was, they would say that, oh, Y2K bug. Do you remember there was this millennium scare of the date changing and the world not keeping up? And in many ways, we became that global workforce that was solving the world's technology challenges at that particular point of time. Why can't we the why can't India produce the world's cyber cohort to keep the digital system safe? Is this an opportunity for India to actually put together and invest in creating the largest cohort that will keep us safe? No, I think that's a great idea. I think uh, I mean I can tell you from a business side, cybersecurity is one of the fastest growing segments for most uh, companies and. Uh, Absolutely, it can be done. I, but I think this is a very sophisticated. You have to understand that this is a strategic thing for some some people to you know use cyber offense as a way to attack. And it's not just cyber offense in terms of penetrating networks. It's also fake news, this that the whole thing. So I think uh, we have to have a very clear strategy. And we, it, if we are going to become so much digitally dependent, we have to address this too. Absolutely. Mariche, that uh, uh, one of the words uh, Nandan just used was uh, actually something I wanted to ask you next. Um, fake news, uh, democracy under threat because of the whole new uh, volumes and models of influence operations, lies, synthetic truth, deep fakes, etc. You had once suggested that if we don't regulate technology, if we regulate technology, can, can democracy survive? And I remember I had said that if we don't regulate technology, will democracy survive? I think we have reached that moment now that mm -hmm. damned if you do, damned if you don't. Uh, what for you is now an essential regulatory uh, um, action that must be taken to preserve the sanctity of the societies we live in, the democracies that we uh, cherish, the, the political systems that we believe must be perpetuated. What do you think is that big question before all of us? India, um, and I, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, ascribe the Stanford hat to you, US and Europe. We have, we have three different, three large uh, uh, unions here. Uh, what do you think is that question we must respond to if we are to keep our political processes, uh, um, you know, the integrity, protect their integrity? Well, I fundamentally believe that democracy should not be disrupted, not by the technologies we know today, not by the technologies we know tomorrow, not by bad actors who know how to use them uh, in, a, in a shrewd way, not by uh, markets that are that are boiling over. And uh, in order to regulate for almost anything, <clears throat> whether it's fair competition or uh, the protection of rights or protection of freedom of expression or public health or so on, we need requirements for access to information to have a look into companies. This is important to know, for example, which kinds of algorithmic amplifications are leading to which kinds of harms. It's important to know which kinds of cybersecurity protections are in place and whether they suffice. It's important to have a threat understanding. The, the irony of a lot of the uh, dynamics in today's digital uh, relationship with states is that not only uh, are, for example, new breaches um, happening, like the SolarWinds breach or Exchange Server hack, but there's also companies needed to appreciate what is even happening. So it's cybersecurity companies that are telling states that other 
technology companies have been compromised. And so essentially, I think too often democratic states uh, is what I'm focused on in this case are blindsided at all. So it leads to to a less than than optimal governance situation because if you don't know what it is exactly that you need to address you have a big problem and so i think in the interest of democratic accountability in the interest of evidence-based policy making uh, in the interest of an ability for the public to learn what happens through technological processes there needs to be a sort of horizontal provision of access to information and then that can be applied with different purposes uh, and, and this is the one thing that I believe is almost like a key that will unlock a number of other solutions in specific sectors <clears throat> and to tackle specific risks or, or problems. Uh, Madam Vice President, I'm sure you have lots to say on this. And I th I'm sure this is something that occupies you quite a bit in your current chair. Would you like to come in on this? Yes, uh, I think this is a very good point. Uh, access to information and, and the right uh, to, to facts uh, that you actually, as a citizens, know, know where to go uh, in order to, to get facts that are checked uh, uh, also by independence. But I think it's really important also to insist that there is a responsibility on the sort of systemic actors. We uh, we have a table a proposal called the Digital Services Act, and in here we are not only asking uh, the big players to deal with sort of specifics that may be illegal, but also to do a general risk assessment of their services. Mm -hmm. How how will our services uh, affect democracy? Like you had uh, your environmental impact assessment reports when you were setting up a big plant. How would yes. they impact society? Very similar for digital industries as well. Exactly. And how will you then mitigate those risks mm -hmm. so that your services uh, who may be set up for, for the, with the best of intentions and to make a business that they that they do not have adverse effects because you have a responsibility when you are a giant player and you're more than welcome to be big. You're more than welcome to be successful in the union. But with success comes power and with power comes responsibility mm -hmm. also at a systemic level. Because just as well as it's really important that each and every one of us as a citizen can make up our own minds, we cannot solve these questions by decentralizing it to the individual. We also mm -hmm. need systemic responsibility to be lifted by some of these giant players. And, and how easy is it in your opinion, in your assessment now, because you've spent a, a few years working on this subject, uh, to get um, uh, this uh, ethic across borders, to get uh, international corporations, uh, distant jurisdictions, to start uh, thinking about all of this like you've been thinking about it. The, the really positive development is that it has changed a lot over the last just five years. Um, I think with some of the, the cybersecurity incidents, uh, but also with what we have seen, the manipulation of elections, uh, the Cambridge Analytical uh, Facebook scandal. Um, there has been a very different awareness of the fact that uh, digitization is not neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, it is like any other industrial revolution that we have been going through. It is such fundamental societal changes <coughs> that we need our democracy to follow through and to regulate also this sector as we have regulated, you know, any other sector. And, and that discussion um, is now a, 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 a lively engaged discussion in, uh, in I think, uh, almost every jurisdiction uh, on this planet. And that also allows for uh, mutual uh, inspiration, uh, to see what others have done, what they have learned, how this can be implemented in the specific um, culture, the specific context. So I, I think we have a much, much better chance today than we had five years ago, uh, not to have sort of one global governance, but for uh, initiatives in all jurisdictions to have the same direction and to talk a, a common language. So I think uh, in Joseph Nye's words, we can possibly move towards regime coherence, where there is a degree of coherence in what all of us want to do, rather than convergence on any single law that applies to everyone. Exactly. Um, 
Uh, then, Nandan, let me ask you another easy question. Uh, you know, if I need food, it, it is uh, something that uh, you or one of your partners has invented in India. If I want, if I want to buy clothes, I have to go through you. If I have to go and meet people, I have to go through you. If I have to build a community page with photographs, it has to be through you. Private sector today literally uh, controls every piece of my life, from essentials to extravagance. Everything that I need has a digital component in it. Uh, do you think there is now a merit to start thinking about an accountable boardroom process where boardrooms of companies are accountable to the consumers they serve, pretty much like the utilities of the previous generation? The utilities that gave you electricity and water had a degree of greater degree of accountability. Do you think it is time for digital tech and digital tech boardrooms to become far more accountable to uh, their their customers and consumers and create new robust mechanisms to hear them? No, I think certainly companies will have to be more accountable, but I don't think you can expect them to do it to themselves. I think you need to have. Uh, an external environment. I mean, when I, when, you know, we, we have a board that does great corporate governance, but we still abide by the rules of the SEBI in India or the SEC in the US uh, in terms of disclosure and so on. So I think uh, while company, you know, companies can be proactive and lead on these things, ultimately it has to be through rule of law. Okay. Uh, Mariche, you were nodding your head. I think you have, a, you have a, something to say on this. No, I'm I'm absolutely in agreement with uh, with everything I've heard. Technology is not neutral; it has to be governed. We have to think about what outcomes we want to optimize for. Uh, you know, rule of law processes are are integral to protecting uh, people's rights, but also you know fairness more broadly. For example, for companies themselves. So uh, I I'm happy to hear what I've uh, what I've heard uh, Anandan and and uh, Commissioner Vestager saying. So good news. Excellent. So we're going to end this conversation. It's been truly a fascinating one. And thank you so much for uh, bringing in such important um, issues into your interventions this evening. But I want to end on a positive note. Uh, I want to ask you all just one question and we want to end with that. That what is it that is, uh, what do you think is exciting in the digital and innovation space that, that in a sense uh, makes you believe in the power of digital and to change the world, to change lives, to help people to transform. Uh, Nandan, let me start with you. Is that one thing that excites you most about the dig digital future? Well, you know, obviously I'm a big believer in technology and digital and I've made my life, my career, my business. So I'm a big believer. However, I do believe that it should be done in a way which is more equitable, uh, in a more empowering way. And, you know, this notion that something is inevitable, I don't buy that. It is very evitable in the sense that it is about the architecture of how the technology is rolled out. I think what happened with the internet was when the internet became uh, went to the private sector, essentially in 1995 with Netscape and so on, there was no revenue model in the internet. And then the revenue model became advertising, which led to its own set of complications. So I think it's really an incomplete internet. And therefore, my focus is really how to make it more complete by fixing the way that you, you have identity, fixing the way that you can make low micro payments at low cost, fixing the way that data can be empowering each person. So I see it more as how do we fix the gap for the internet and make, make it more uh, empowering and equitable. Your proposition that we have built the net for the first one billion, it is time to complete the net for the next six and a half billion who are still to benefit from the full advantages of the digital. No, it's not about one billion, uh, Sameer. The fact what happened was in 95, Netscape came and then all the other guys came. There was no revenue model in the internet. There was no way to make money by selling things. So the only way you could sell eyeballs. And the moment you got into that business, then it became a data game. Correct. So, right. so it's it's really that I don't think we fully uh, we fully understood the implications of the enormity of what was happening. So I think we have to fix that. And I'm a great believer that it has been done through regulation, but also it has to be fixed by creating technology that can handle some of these things. Mariche, what excites you about technology and innovation? Well, I, I agree with the proposition that nothing is inevitable and so we really have to build for a better future and when I look at the students that I teach at Stanford and I see how driven they are, how smart they are and uh, how idealistic they are as well, then they give me hope. 
so I'm not quite sure yet what they're going to be building, but if they take that idealism and if they find opportunities, you know, to um, to give that uh, space either in, in building uh, new systems or, or products or rather uh, sitting on the on the regulatory side to make sure that it's all done within frameworks that that preserve our values, then I think we'll be in a great place. And the final word to you, uh, Madam uh, Vice President. That, that, really, uh, that really excites me is that the digital future is human. Mm -hmm. That it, it's all about human life, uh, mm -hmm. human empowerment, uh, human communities, uh, living in, in equal, uh, inclusive uh, societies. Uh, never before have we had such tools uh, at our disposal to create societies that are truly human. And we can even deal with a number of the problems that we have created for ourselves, uh, climate change being an obvious one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the potential is really big to limit uh, emissions by the best use of digital technologies. Right. And, and, and I really like this, that uh, we as humans can, can even better take upon us the responsibility for ourselves and for others, because we have these amazing tools uh, at our disposal if we get in control of the dark side uh, of the same tools. So we started the panel discussion with the title Recoding the Future, and we have reached the conclusion that the future is human. And hence, uh, the digital must continue to nourish all of us. Uh, food for thought from these three wonderful panelists, Vice President Vesteya, Nandan Nelakani, and Marisha Shake. Thank you so much for joining us at Vicena Dialogue. And hopefully next year we meet in person and carry this conversation uh, forward. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Looking forward to meet you in person. Thank you. Thank you.